Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Now, as we enter into our study this morning, as we consider specific points, as we look to discuss these points amongst ourselves, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction so that we may respectfully understand what he is trying to show us at this time and be guided in the path that he would have us to walk. Shall we now seek his face in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we ask, Father, for your forgiveness of our sins, for we know that they are many. We ask, Father, for your guidance and your direction as we open your word. Father, as we join together and we come before you, may your angels attend us. <clears throat> may our minds be opened by the Spirit so that we may see things that you would have us to understand. Direct us now. Do with us that is necessary so that we may draw together and may come to learn more of you. May it be that your character may be before us, that your wisdom will be with us, and that your guidance may open our minds to understand that which you would have us to do at this time. We thank you for this opportunity. We praise you, Father, for your blessings. Direct us now. We ask, we pray, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. In our studies this last week, a comment was made during the studies that <clears throat> referred back to a presentation that I had made on December 12th of 2020. Numerically, we're talking 12-12-2020. We are looking at a, a former study that was heard but not very well received. Let us now look at the symbolisms that we are going to address. And I will be happy to share this study with anyone that wishes a copy of it. Now, from 4A, Spiritual Gifts, page 68.2. From the pen of inspiration, we read, <clears throat> Now, these men who had been valiant and a terror to their numerous enemies were afraid to go out against the Philistines to battle. They had their king, but did not dare trust in him. And they felt that they had chosen him before the strength of Israel. When they were brought into this perplexing condition, their hearts fainted. The people scattered in their distress and hid themselves in caves and in thickets and in high places and in pits as though escaping from captivity. Those who ventured to go with Saul followed him trembling. He was in great perplexity as he saw that the people were scattered from him. He anxiously awaited the promised coming of Samuel, but the time expired, and he came not. God had designedly detained Samuel, that his people might be proved and might realize their sin, and how small was their strength and weak their judgment and wisdom without God. Symbolically, what are we looking at here? What do you think we're looking at? Well, symbolically? Like, yep. what is line is this? Or Okay, I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm not trying to be obtuse. I want you to take a look at this. I want you to consider this. And if I'm wrong, I want you to tell me. I think this is the movement after July 18th of 2020. Okay. So what, what symbols would tie that together? When July 18th happened, what happened to the balance of the people that had been following FFA. Mm -hmm. They scattered and so fell off. Exactly. Okay, so what? who would Saul represent then? Who would the Philistines represent? Is it possible that Saul is representing Jeff? Well, yeah, that's possible. Um, now remember, in, in you all of... We just can't guess at it, though. I'm I'm not trying to guess at it. I'm putting forth a premise either to be proven or laid aside. Now, Signs of the Times, August 3rd, 1882. It was not until the second year of Saul's reign that an attempt was made to subdue the Philistines. The first blow was struck by Jonathan, who at the command of his father attacked and overcame their garrison at Geba. The Philistines were greatly exasperated by this defeat and they made ready for a speedy attack upon Israel. Saul was now aroused to the necessity of immediate action. He caused war to be proclaimed by the sound of the trumpet through the land. 
and also issued a proclamation calling upon all the men of war, including the tribes across the Jordan, to assemble immediately at Gilgal. This yeah, summons so was obeyed. Yeah, so this is First Samuel chapter 13 that she's referring to when she says it was not until the second year of Saul's reign that an attempt was made to subdue the Philistines. Right. Right. Okay. Any question about that? Well, uh, one of the things, just from a chronological point of view, and, and Stephen would know this, is that, um, you know, there's there's dispute about that verse in 1 Samuel 13, verse 1. But Alan White's quite clear that it's talking about the second year of Saul's reign. And so it's going to be early in Saul's reign. And this relates to the 400 years dealing with that Ellen White talks about with um what is it, Stephen, the 400 years for the Amalekites, the children of Amalek? Is that what it's about, that, that we date, Stephen? In other words, the Amalekites' time of probation? Yeah. Sorry, you speak to me? Yeah. So that 400 years of the Amalekites, um, yes. that connects to this, this history here, right? Yes. Okay. So anyway, I just wanted – so 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 the symbol – here that when we're dealing with the second year of Saul's reign now which year in Saul's reign is it going to be the fourth year of Saul's reign that the 400 years would end is that what we have decided well it's uh I'm thinking it's after that I think it's the 10th year so it's the 10th year that the 400 years would be because you're going to start the 400 years in uh what 1493 or 1492 BC um just check here. See, I have it the, the same year as David is born. Okay. Is uh, when I, I think it happened, going from what Elm White uh, and yeah. the Bible, really. Okay. Um, but 400 years exactly, so it's not going to be 400 years exactly. Because um, when there's that statement made about Amalek, that's going to be in 1493, isn't it? Or Because uh, that's in Deuter- Is it in Deuteronomy that we get that? Yes, it's um, that's when they began to enter the Promised Land. But it's only when they had actually taken the Promised Land were they then to uh, defeat Amalek. Because I don't think they were part of the, uh, the the Seven Kingdoms of Canaan. So it just says, the, the promise that you read about in Deuteronomy says that once you've had that rest in the land, then go and uh, defeat Amalek. Yeah, so it's... Okay, so it's Deuteronomy 25, 19. Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Thou shalt not forget it. So you're saying you're going to count from there six years? Yeah, so from 1487, so 400 years would take you to um, 1187. Yeah, which is 10 years into Saul's reign. And then David was born then. Okay, okay, so it's around the time David's born that that they that Saul is told to destroy Amalek, and that's going to be 400 years, Ellen White says. So that's one of the chronological keys. Now, then the question is, just because I'm trying to answer this question, as far as the symbols, how would we use the 400 years as a symbol connected to this movement? Is there any way that we've ever done that? Well, prophetically, it's 144,000 days. But okay. it's, also, it's also interesting in connecting that 400 years. That means that Saul's reign would have begun about 390 years into that 400 years of the Amalekites. Yeah. Yeah, correct. So if this is so we have the 390, and then we have uh, one year, right? So 391, and then it's his second year. Does that make sense? Yeah, we'd have, we'd have 391 years into that yeah. second year, so we could easily have the symbol of 391.5. Yeah, okay. Okay, so there, so there we have a symbol that ties it to the movement, which is what I wanted. Well, I have it uh, 392 years. Right. So, uh, 
Yeah, but you're counting a whole year because it's the second year that's an ordinal count. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's his first yes. year. Right, okay. So that's what we're saying. And, that, and well, that's how we... 351 yeah, and a half days. What? What's that? Yes, okay. I, th I thought maybe Ellen White had made another statement concerning that. But yeah, she says... It was not until the second year of Saul's reign that an attempt was made to subdue the Philistines. Mm -hmm. And then that was, uh, the first blow was struck by Jonathan. Mm -hmm. Akiba. Now, now Jonathan means gift of God. It mean, it's the, it's the Hebrew or gift of Jehovah. Uh, my name Theodore means gift of God. They're sort of related names. One's Greek, one's Hebrew. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that, that's significant there. Okay. The Philistines had gathered an immense force at McMash, 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is upon the seashore innumerable. When the Hebrews became apprised of the strength and the numbers of the opposing force, and then considered their own defenseless condition, they became terrified and disheartened. Every day saw the army of Saul diminishing as multitudes of the people stole away to hide themselves in caves, in thickets and pits, and some even fled across the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Those who still remained followed him trembling. Where now was Israel's pride and confidence in their king? Demanded, as they had declared, that we may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us, and go out before us and fight our battles. Alas, how utterly worthless are all the hopes based upon human pomp or pride. Samuel, okay. um, go ahead. Just, just a comment here about, so you got the 30,000 chariots and the 6,000 horsemen. That's 36. Right. Right, which, which symbolizes, uh, you know, prophetic time, right? Okay. And, and then, um, you know, it, you're going to see later, that, that, that Saul's going to wait seven days. Like there's a seven days period according to the set time. And that set time there is the word Moed, uh, that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal and the people were scattered from him. So, so there's like this 391 and a half years. And then there's the symbol of the 36 or 360. And right. then there's the seven days tarrying time, which could represent the 777 structure. Correct. Yeah. Or just even the seven times in some ways, but easily okay. seven times. Yeah. Okay. Samuel had been appointed to meet the king at Gilgal, there to offer burnt offerings and sacrifices and to show him what he should do. The prophet did not arrive within the allotted time. And as Saul, as Saul saw their dangers increasing and the hearts of the people failing for fear, he became impatient. Instead of resorting to prayer and humbling his soul before God, he determined to do something himself to relieve the difficulties of the situation. Now, after July 18th, what happened? How many within the movement resorted to prayer? How many were humbling their souls before God. How many decide, decided that there was something that was not correct rather than relying upon God? Well, we don't know how many people spent time in prayer or anything, but definitely the actions were not, they were to try to do something, right? Determined right. to do something, that idea that something had to be done about this failure, um, that it had to be resolved. Lots of people just wanted to do something instead of waiting on God, right? So we weren't really seeking God for an answer as a movement. We were trying to settle the issue through human means and ways. So, you know, it, it's pretty clear that this is a, a parallel to what happened within the movement, right? So people didn't have the patience to just wait. Exactly. Yeah, I thought it was very rash. You know, the the declaration made on December 6, 2020 was very rash. Now, and, and the actions were rash. The a comment from the chat 
it goes back to what we were talking about on the 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen. Yeah. Was giving reference to the chariots and horsemen mentioned in Daniel 1140. Yeah. So the chariots and the horsemen is, is a symbol that would talk to our message. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now, from letter 116 of 1897, she writes, Appearances were discouraging, and Saul looked at these outward appearances. In the place of looking to God, in the place of trusting in him, and waiting for Samuel to appear, he became impatient and took upon himself responsibilities which the Lord had not laid upon him. He attempted to do a work which he could not perform acceptably to God. How blunt is this comment? What do we see here? It confirms the statement, haste makes waste. In leading on your own strength, you're performing something which isn't prescribed by God, and scattering and failure results. I speak from personal experience, by the way. Okay. Now, how often are we looking at this? How often can we look at this kind of a situation where we have seen that man is more willing to try to take on a responsibility, to try to take on a position that God is not leading them into? Is this what we're supposed to do at this time? Well, just as Saul should have been waiting patiently for Samuel, and so should the people, so should we be. Uh, the prophecy seemed to have failed. I don't believe it did. I believe it performed the purpose it was designed to do, to sift right. us. And we should be waiting for God to to lead us further in light. What is God trying to show us from these experiences should be our question always. Right. Any other comment? I find it quite telling where Saul was concerned that he attempted to do a work which he could not perform acceptably to God. Returning to Signs of the Times, August 3rd of 1882. Here is where many have failed and continue to fail. They will not wait patiently for the Lord to work for them. They desire to be active. And if God does not give them something to do, they will venture to do even what he has forbidden. The Lord had detained his servant in order to test the faith and the obedience of the king. Saul did not stand the test. God had promised to be with him if he would be obedient. He should have trusted this promise and waited patiently for divine instruction and guidance. But thinking that something must be done at once to inspire the people with courage, he commanded them to bring forward their victims for sacrifice. And then he presumptuously took the place of priest and himself offered them upon the altar. This act was a flagrant violation of the divine command that only those should offer sacrifice who had been sacredly concentrated to the work. Moreover, the public nature of the act, as well as the high position of the offender, added greatly to the pernicious influence of his example and rendered prompt punishment indispensably necessary. The Lord passed by Saul as the chosen king of Israel, because as king of Israel, he did not follow the requirements of God, but chose his own ideas and his own methods. Standing at the head as he did, he could mislead Israel from following the Lord. It was God's... Go ahead. So, this is the thing. So, I mean, it definitely can represent the the movement, not really just Jeff as a person. Right. Which is how I would take it. Any other thoughts on that? Would you agree or disagree? Well, the verse that comes to me is there's none righteous, no, not one. We're all guilty. Yeah. And and we could say FFA or the movement, something to that effect, rather than narrowing it down to Jeff. Okay. It was God's design in the detention of Samuel that the heart of Saul should be revealed, that others might know what he would do in an emergency. If we were to apply this to today, It was God's design in 
the detention of the destruction of Nashville that the heart of FFA should be revealed that others might know what would happen in an emergency. Would that be a fair addressment at this time? I think so. I mean, one, one of the things that I'm having to look at with everything that has been ongoing for the last four or five weeks for me, I've had a lot of people expressing sympathy over my mother's passing. And I greatly appreciate those that have, have expressed themselves in that way. But I've had many others that are either coming by or calling, texting, emailing as to what am I doing? How come things are going so slowly? Why can't you tell me when this is going to happen? What, what, what's happening? What can I do to help you make things happen faster? Maybe they need to be tuning in to what you're saying right now, what we're sharing right now for an answer. It could be. Well, I understand, you know, your, your situation. I mean, one is we need to be patient. That's the point. And, and, you know, I'm the most patient person I know, but my patience is always tested. Um, you know, I've spent most of my life waiting for other people to make decisions, but I always know what to do. Okay. And, and that, and it's pretty simple. You do the things that are before you that you have control over and the things you don't have control over you leave in God's hands. Right. That, that, that's the way that I've lived my life. I know what my present duty is. I don't know the end result of anything. So those things I don't fret about. Okay. If he, if Saul would under all circumstances obey the orders given him from one who in all things received his orders from heaven, the head of the nation could then be trusted. If he, if, then if we place this F, if FFA would under all circumstances obey the orders given them from one who in all things received his orders from heaven. Who's being referenced here? Well, this is Christ. Exactly. Then the head of the movement could then be trusted. Yeah. I mean, we can see it. I mean, you can bring this down to individuals too. I mean, you could say Jeff or whatever, but uh, the reality is, I mean, there are people involved. And people are acting rashly. They're not taking the time to consider things properly. And right. they've already drawn a conclusion when they, they make a pretense of examining something. Well, okay. you could, you could, you could put this to individuals as well, even us. I mean, I could see where, you know, I have gone off when I was supposed to and been disobedient. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and done something that I, I shouldn't have done. And if I just waited, God would have worked it out. So, I mean, you just bring this down to every individual, you know, in the movement. Yeah. Well, we all understand. Oh, we all understand the feelings that other people had because we all had them. Right. Right. You know, the question is, what did we do about those feelings? And And, of course, every person has to answer that themselves um, and I don't think any one of us are without fault in things we said and did in frustrations we experienced and how we acted but definitely the movement did not act in a way that it should considering the circumstances if we truly believe that God was leading us uh, to question whether God was leading us or not sounds like ancient Israel exactly because this next statement all who are in positions of responsibility must follow implicitly the counsels of god brothers and sisters we are in the fire we are in the last great training school to give a final message to this world and where is that message to begin if we look at ezekiel 9 where does this message begin at the house of god exactly we are being placed into positions of responsibility we must follow implicitly the counsels of god 
Is this not the work that God approves when someone is willing to follow implicitly his word? Yeah, and implicitly here means without qualification or absolutely, because there is another meaning of implicitly, but she's using this meaning. I, I've always taken it to follow the counsels of God without question. Yeah, well, without qualification, without question, yeah. There is another one that means it's just done tacitly, but... Uh, Correct. But but it's not that definition. All who are in positions of responsibility must follow implicitly the counsels of God. It was a trying place for Saul, but he had not obeyed orders and waited for Samuel. He did not feel that it would make a difference who should approach God and in what way. Saul was tried and full of energy and self-complacency, he put himself forward into sacred office for which he was not appointed. If Saul would pursue such a course in an emergency, the people would follow his example, and thus no distinction would be made between the sacred and the common. By his example, he left it open for the men of war to assume the priesthood on any occasion or in any emergency. What does this say to you now? What should this be saying to us as a movement now? Are we to go off based upon our feelings, or are we to follow God based upon his principles? Well, his principles. So the first thing that we did after July 18th that I think was good is we spent time studying. Yes. Right? We reviewed a lot of things, and and then we we examined the foundation. Was the foundation laid correctly? And then we sought to understand the lines, right? So we went, we did what we were supposed to do, and the whole movement should have done that. That is, you know, sure they had studies, you know, the American and Canadian groups on Sabbath, but a lot of it was really irrelevant to our disappointment, right? right. They, they, they weren't they weren't looking at or wanting to examine what had happened. And I was interested to know what had happened. How how did we get here? And and there wasn't much of an interest in the movement to do that, which I think is is the real problem. And then to find oh, are she speaking of sorry, Theodore, go on. No, you can go on. Uh, I'm looking at by his example, that's Saul's example. He left it open for the men of war. These are soldiers who are slaying people to assume the priesthood on any occasion or in any emergency. So just haphazardly take whatever role you want. So I was brought to uh, Isaiah 115. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. That's the problem with assuming roles we're not supposed to assume. Right. Are we to take on any role that we decide is necessary when an emergency comes? I'm brought back to January 29th of 2018. I believe it was when my daughter was threatening suicide. I was thousands of miles away. All I could do was counsel her to turn to the Lord, throw everything on Jesus, let him bear the burden. You know, I was begging her to do that. She ended up hanging up on me. I went back to my house because I didn't even have, have a phone where I was. And the Lord said, what are you doing? Get on your knees, intercede for your daughter. I prayed and I prayed and I wept for her. And all of a sudden I felt my hands raising to heaven. And I knew at that moment Christ had intervened and saved her. She's still alive today and doing much, much better. Thank you for that witness. Now, returning again to Signs of the Times, August 3rd of 1882. No sooner had Saul made an end of offering sacrifice than he heard of Samuel's approach, and he went out to meet him. But though greeted with demonstrations of reverence and affection, the prophet understood that all was not right. In answer to his pointed inquiry, what hast thou done? Saul endeavored to excuse his own course by depicting the terror of the people 
and the danger of an immediate attack from the Philistines. But the prophet returned the stern and the solemn answer. Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hath not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. First Samuel 13, 13, and 14. Saul's transgression proved him unworthy to be entrusted with sacred responsibilities. One who had himself so little reverence for God's requirements could not be a wise or safe leader for the nation. Had he patiently endured the divine test, the crown would have been confirmed to him and to his house. In fact, Samuel had come to Gilgal for this very purpose. But Saul had been weighed in the balance and found wanting. He must be removed to make way for one who would sacredly regard the divine honor and authority. Can we apply in the situation with Saul? Mini, mini, tekel, you farson. Yes, we can. Is this a pronouncement that we wish to hear about ourselves? No, it isn't. It says uh, he must be removed to make way for one who would sacredly regard the divine honor on authority. It reminds me of uh, where Christ says uh, about the candlestick being removed. You know, the warning about that and uh, that others would take our place that were found unfaithful. Here we are. Saul, at this time, had been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Was this at the end of his reign of Israel? When was he to come to Gilgal? Was this not within the first 10 years of his reign? Continuing. An all-wise God had foreseen these events. Yet Saul's threatened humiliation was was chargeable only to his own sin and folly. God had given him great advantages to develop a right character. The Holy Spirit had enlightened his understanding, giving him clear views of the divine character and requirements and of his own duty. All this made his sin more grievous. Who is it that the pen of inspiration states, has been given great advantages and great light. Seventh-day Adventists. Exactly. And what is the outcome when you are given great advantages and great light? What are you to develop? What are we to develop? The Christ-like character. Exactly. Christ-like character. Had Saul cherished the light which Christ had given him, he would have trusted less to the performance of religious rites and would have felt more deeply the importance of humbling his heart before God. Impulse would have been guided by reason and chastened and purified by conscience. But it is difficult for a man whose habits are fixed to unlearn what he has for years been learning. Divine grace only can affect this transformation. Brothers and sisters, are we to trust in the structure, in the forms, in the men that are considered as leaders within any church? No, um, pretty dangerous to do that. We're, 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 ob- ob- we're, ob- we're obligated to study for ourselves. Exactly. Where are we to trust? And in whom are we to trust? We need to trust in God. Only in Christ. In Christ what? In Christ alone. Amen? I mean, I have a question. Yes. According to this statement that you've, been, that you've just read, but it is difficult for a man whose habits are fixed to unlearn what he has for he has been learning. Divine grace only can affect this 
can affect this information. No. Yes. What input does this part? What input can this person like impart in that act of being transformed? Oh, it's only for the divine grace to to work upon him. Yes, okay. we've seen that things have been fixed, and what can he do as when he gets into such a situation? Okay, brother, I'm going to give you a personal testimony. When I was young, I had a very violent temper. My mother was very direct with me in many ways, but she also was very specific. She was afraid for me because she said with the temper that I had, if I continued to allow that temper to hold sway in my life, I would eventually kill someone, if not be killed myself. We are given choices. We are all given choices. We have sins that are inherited. We have sins that we have chosen. We have sins that have beset us for years. These are examples of habits that are fixed. We need to unlearn many of these things that for years we have chosen to learn. We need to trust not only that Christ is able to remove the effects of these sins from us, but that he is willing to do so, but we need to trust. This is how divine grace can affect this transformation. Thank you. Now, we're coming close to the close of our time today. Do you have any other comments, questions, or observations from what we've read? Well, it definitely can parallel this movement. So, and, and so we have those symbols there. I mean, I was looking at some of the other symbols and trying to sort through them. But, you know, um, we, we we're going to study. We're, if we hadn't gone to the study on Daniel chapter 11 or 10, 11, and 12, we were actually going to go into studying uh, 1 Samuel. That was going to be our next thing to study. Um, but which which we're going to come to again, because after Judges, well, then you study Samuel, right? So we're going to come back to that at some point. So there's lots of things that we're going to be looking at in these in putting them on a line. But you could clearly see how we could put that on that line um, with the 391 and a half years and and uh, the 36 and the seven days. So so it is interesting. Now, are you going to go through more of this study next week? Yes. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're only halfway through the document. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for your promise and the word that you have given of which you are able to fulfill, that if we believe in you and we believe that you alone can help transform us so that our characters may become more like yours, that we may then be saved. We thank you, Father, for this time that we've spent together. We pray, Father, for the meeting that is next to occur. We ask now, Father, for your guidance, your direction, and your blessing, so that which we do may help us to learn more of you, so that we may become the people that would be prepared to give this message that you want given to this world. Guide us to this end. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.